All right, welcome to Spirometry for Primary Care. My name is Andy Morris, and I'm one of the MAHEC faculty here at the Hendersonville Family Medicine Residency Program. Let's first review the indications for spirometry. Number one is to aid in the diagnosis of respiratory disorders. It gives us information about obstructive diseases versus restrictive diseases. Two is to check for presence of disease in the setting of mild symptoms. Three is to determine the appropriate therapy by staging COPD and testing bronchodilator responsiveness to assess impairment preoperatively or for disability claims. And finally, to assess baseline and detect adverse reactions in patients taking long-term drugs with potential pulmonary toxicity. The three most common drugs seen in our clinic with that indication are amiodarone, nitrofurantoin, and methotrexate. Who is recommending spirometry? The National Lung Heart Education Program says that every smoker at 45 years of age should have spirometry to assess for the presence of COPD. The National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute says every COPD patient should have spirometry not only for diagnosis, but also at the time of initial assessment after treatment is initiated and at least every one to two years to assess the maintenance of airway function. What are the differences between office-based spirometry and pulmonary function testing. Spirometry is using a handheld unit and specifically looks at forced vital capacity and forced expiratory volume. Pulmonary function testing happens in a closed chamber and in addition to those measures of spirometry adds diffusion capacity and total lung capacity. This slide shows an example of the flow volume loop. There are several measures on here which are important to interpreting spirometry. In the first second of the flow volume loop is when a normal lung expires the maximal amount of air. Over the next six seconds, you can see that the liters per second expired decrease. What is the FEV1? The forced expiratory volume in the first second is the amount of air that you can blow out in that first second. Normally, that's above 80% expected for sex, age, and height. What is the FVC? The forced vital capacity is the amount of air that can be blown out after maximal inspiration, and it's dependent on height, weight, age, sex, and ethnicity, all of which you have to enter into the spirometry program before performing the test. A normal forced vital capacity is greater than or equal to 80%. What does it mean if the forced vital capacity is less than 80%? Well, some patients with COPD have a low FVC due to air trapping, but it's usually greater than 60% predicted. An FEV1 over FVC will still be less than 70%. A decrease in FVC with an FEV1 over the FVC of greater than 70% indicates a restrictive lung disease and should be referred to a pulmonologist for complete pulmonary function testing to come up with a definitive diagnosis. Let's talk about the FEV1 to FVC ratio. This is a ratio of the amount of air that you can blow out in the first second to the total amount of air that you can blow out generally over six seconds. Less than 70% indicates obstruction in adults. In kids ages 5 to 18, less than 85% can indicate obstruction. In that case, we are mostly dealing with the diagnosis of asthma. I want to show you now a slide of the GOLD staging system. GOLD stands for Global Initiative for Obstructive Lung Disease. Their spirometry staging system has four different stages. Take note that the FEV1 over FVC in all obstructive lung disease is less than 0.7 or 70%. Where we find the differences are in the FEV1. Mild disease is listed as greater than or equal to 80%. Moderate disease, 50 to less than or equal to 80%. Severe disease, 30 to less than or equal to 50%. And very se severe disease, or stage 4, is less than or equal to 30%. Let's look now at some other measurements that you will get after a spirometry test. The FEF2575 is the forced expiratory flow over the middle one-half of the forced vital capacity. 
the average flow from the point at which 25% of the FVC has been exhaled to 75%, and this is measured in liters per second. It is the most sensitive marker for obstruction, and it's often abnormal even when the FEV1 and the PEF are normal. It's very useful to track control of asthmatics or detect slight progression of obstructive disease. The peak expiratory flow rate is the same parameter used in managing asthma with a handheld peak flow unit. Less than 80% of predicted for age, sex, and weight indicates obstruction. The forced expiratory time is the number of seconds required to exhale the FVC. In a normal patient, that's less than five seconds. But in severely obstructed patients, they may take up to 15 seconds to exhale their full FVC. Let's talk about how to perform spirometry. You want at least three acceptable spirograms in order to have an accurate result. The subject should exhale for at least six seconds and then inhale when there is no volume change for approximately one second. The difference between the two largest force vital capacity measurements needs to be less than 5% or within 150 milliliters. When performing spirometry, it's important to make sure that the patient has not taken a short-acting bronchodilator within the last six hours or a long-acting bronchodilator in the last 12 hours. They shouldn't have been recently hospitalized for respiratory disease, and they shouldn't have an exacerbation of their asthma or COPD. If they are sick, they should come back at a later time when they're at their baseline. They should not currently be on steroids. They should also be in the standing position because sitting down will reduce the force bottle capacity by at least 2%. Their lips should be completely sealed over the mouthpiece and you should have an experienced administrator. At the beginning of each spirometry clinic, one of the first things you'll want to do before patients arrive is calibrate your spirometer to ensure that you have a good test result. This is a three liter calibration syringe which mimics a three liter lung. You're going to take your handheld spirometer, hook the attachment gasket to the end, hook your spirometer to the calibration syringe, and hit start on your computer program. When the cursor starts to move, you want to chase that cursor with the syringe handle until you get at least three matching results. Now you're ready to do spirometry. This is our handheld spirometer. We have a new mouthpiece for you that we're going to put in now that we've calibrated our machine. You're going to hold it with the long end facing towards your mouth and we're going to ask you to place this on your nose um, so you're only breathing through your mouth. You go ahead and put that on. When I hit start new test there's going to be a graphic that comes up of a birthday cake with candles on it and I want you to blow out as hard and fast as you can. We're going to try to make it all the way to six seconds uh, with your lips sealed around the mouthpiece and when you finish the six seconds I will say breathe and you'll take a complete breath in with your mouth remaining on the mouthpiece to create the bottom of our flow volume loop. It's really hard to blow out for six seconds when you don't have obstructive disease. So don't pace yourself. You want to pretend like you're blowing out birthday candles across the room so you're really going to try to get as much air out as you can in that first second. And go, 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 keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going, more, 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 more. Good, and breathe in. Excellent. Good test. Okay, we want to try to get three matches. And go, 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 Okay, good job. So as we briefly look at your values, you have the normal lung function today. If you didn't have normal lung function at this time, we would give you a nebulizer treatment of albuterol or ipratropium. We would wait 15 minutes and repeat the test again to see if it improved your lung function. Now that we've completed our spirometry test, it's time to interpret the spirometry report. 
Number one, you want to know, is the force vital capacity within normal limits? Is it greater than 80% for age, sex, and height? And secondly, is the FEV1 within normal limits? Is it greater than or equal to 80%? If both the force vital capacity and the forced expiratory volume in the first second are normal, stop. You have a normal spirometry test and you don't need to examine the ratio between the FEV1 and the FVC. If the FVC or the FEV1 are low, then we need to look at the FEV1 over FVC ratio. An FEV1 over FVC greater than 70% indicates restrictive disease. An FEV1 over FVC less than 70% indicates obstructive disease. One caveat is to remember that in children ages 5 to 18, an FEV1 over FVC less than 0.85 or 85% indicates obstruction. The next step is to determine the degree of obstruction by looking at your FEV1 percentage. Again, we're going to go back to the gold staging system to remind us that in mild disease, you have greater than 80% FEV1, moderate 50 to 80, severe 30 to 50, and very severe less than 30%. If your patient has abnormal spirometry indicating obstruction, the next stage is to do a bronchodilator treatment with a short-acting bronchodilator, in most cases either albuterol or ipratropium. They should sit for approximately 15 minutes after the administration of that test prior to doing another spirometry test, at which time you will compare the outcomes of the two tests. What we are looking for is the degree of reversibility after treatment. If the FEV1 and FVC are fully reversible, meaning that your force vital capacity after treatment is 80% or more, and your FEV1 over FVC is greater than 70%, then think asthma asthma that's responding to the bronchodilator treatment. If the FEV1 increases by 12% or greater than 200 milliliters in adult, then the patient may have asthma, but they could also have a combination of asthma and COPD. Approximately a third of our COPD patients have at least that much reversibility. The key is that their FEV1 over FVC remains less than 70% even after treatment. Measuring airway reactivity with the methacholine challenge test can also be an important part of diagnosing asthma because the asthmatic may not be symptomatic when they come to spirometry. This is most often done in a pulmonology or asthma specialty office because of the risk of provoking severe bronchoconstriction. However, I want you to be aware of the methacholine challenge test because you may be reviewing reports that have that diagnosis available. Furthermore, sometimes patients undergo exercise stress spirometry to diagnose exercise-induced asthma, though in our clinic we most often diagnose that through a classic history. We also need to make sure that when we're doing spirometry that we get paid. These are some average costs that are available on the internet for spirometry. Spirometry without bronchodilation pays approximately $34, and spirometry with bronchodilator therapy pays approximately $58. There's also a separate code you need to add for the administration of your bronchodilator, and don't forget to bill for the medicine. Thank you for your attention during this presentation on spirometry. Let's Spiro.